to Fribbrick Day in Conversation. We're back for another episode and it is with the awesome Jenna Masterton. Hello Jenna, whoa, 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 Jenna's in the virtual room. Hey Frank. <laughs> before, we, before we have a conversation, we're going to go right into giving you a bit of a bio on who is Jenna, what is Jenna all about? So Jenna is the founder of The Gifted Kind, a community interest company and is on a mission to raise children and young people to be leaders of their own happiness. How great is that? A graduate of Strathclyde University and former primary school teacher, Jenna's specialisms and credentials exist now with personal performance, life coaching, mindfulness and positive mental health, to name a few. Last year, the business incorporated as a social enterprise with Jenna appointing two co-directors, Louisa and Karen, to champion the Being Happy Begins Early message. And notably, most recently, The Gifted Kind was awarded £30,000 from Scotland's Social Entrepreneurship Fund for their early years innovation plans. A lot has been happening, Jenna. Yeah. How are you? How are you? (laughs) Yeah, I'm doing not bad, thank you. Got the Friday feeling and the sun shining, so it's good to be here. And it's, and it's lovely to have you with us. Thanks very much for being part um, of, of the conversation. Where are you in the world today? Where are you in Scotland? So I'm in Ayrshire, North Ayrshire to be precise. Excellent. Yep. And, it's a, and it's a lovely day in North Ayrshire. I'm currently looking out at the, I can see Aaron from where I'm sitting. It's a very, very lucky. And uh, it's early morning we're recording this roughly. So we've got the rest of the day ahead once we wrap this up. Oh, I know. It's good, good thought to have. I've listened to quite a few of your episodes already and heard about this few you have over there, and so I'm very jealous. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm, very, I'm very lucky. Anyway, let's go into this conversation and hear more about you, uh, Jenna, and the organisation. Before we get into that as well, how, how's the past year been for you personally from a lockdown perspective? How have you coped personally? Hmm. It's definitely been challenging. Um, probably one of the most challenging years of my life. But that can sometimes be the making of you. So I suppose I could actually get quite emotional at times reflecting on what the last year has been like. You know, how it's impacted me personally and professionally, like you say, how it's impacted the gifted kind, but how it's impacted those you love as well and all the things that you hear in the news. Um, I'm definitely an emotional being, so just always looking out for everybody else as well as myself. But I think that's the main thing I had to really kick into touch at the beginning of lockdown. It was the whole put your own oxygen mask on first or you're not really going to get yourself through this. And I remember making a pledge to our followers just days after it happened because I had a bit more time to maybe process what was about to happen and that my partner and I had just come back from Milan almost 100% sure we contracted coronavirus wow. and the week before lockdown happened being contacted from all the head teachers we were in programs with and projects with to say that's it for now <laughs> so and then you know remember at the start it was very much it was a three month thing so I was like okay let's just take stock pause let's not panic there's a lot oh. of chaos going on bring the cam like use these tools that you teach everybody yeah. else yeah <laughs> Um, and of course it's lasted a lot longer than that so but overall this time has just given me a sense of renewal even last week was the first time I really felt myself coming back again if that makes sense totally. my friends at university uh, nicknamed me Jenergy yeah, <laughs> I, I like that yeah, I, I haven't felt like Jenergy for most of the <laughs> I'm, 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 I'm laughing at that. I'm not laughing because you weren't feeling like that for the past year, but I love the general name. I just think this, it, there's, there's, so much, there's so much to that. It's great. And I'm glad you're feeling more like that person again. Yeah, it's a relief. Massive relief. And yeah, it was just a case of biding your time, being patient, and knowing that this time could change everything. So let's see what you're willing to change what's here to what's here to stay and what's what's not if you're brave enough yeah yeah yeah. open all plans ego everything and uh, it's definitely just made me re-look at things reimagine things that's a good word (laughs) reimagine and and i love that i think it's i think we've all we've all experienced something like that in some shape or form jenna haven't we some maybe more than others but um, I'm glad and hopefully uh, we can start to see some some shining bright rainbow light at the end, at the end of this, what's been a, a long tunnel, hasn't it? Uh-huh. Well, that, as I said, that was the pledge that by the time this was over, I would still be here. 
that's yeah. a pledge I made to everybody. So fingers crossed. <laughs> and, and and you are thankfully. So let's let's talk about the gifted kind then. T tell us briefly, Jenna, what what is the gifted kind really um, all about? What is it that you you offer for anyone listening that's never came across you or the brand before? Tell us uh, tell us about the gifted kind. So it's absolutely a social mission, and we've sort of coined this phrase that together with families and educators, we want to raise children and young people to be leaders of their happiness. And on this whole spectrum of mental health, which we all have, just like we all have a physical health, we are very much aware that there needs to be support organisations and professionals and individuals, um, community-based led initiatives to support everyone at every part of that spectrum. But we are certainly looking to focus on the positive end of it and through early intervention, teaching skills and tools and techniques from a very young age um, to safeguard happiness, to protect well-being and to make children and young people empowered that they can learn skills like emotional resourcefulness, resiliency, reflectiveness, um, some of the key, the key skills for the future now. So yeah, I mean, it's, it's a, our methodology I'd like to think is unique, although there's lots of people doing lots of things to support positive mental health and um, the future of Scotland's children. And that creativity that we bring now with the other two directors on board um, means that we have quite a few different ways to get the best out of children and to help them reach their fullest potential. And I think probably my year out before university when I did a volunteer project in a school um, that was in a deprived area, just learned very quickly before I went into my undergraduate uh, course that until children are ready to learn, they're not going to be able to learn to take it in. And that is the mood, the mindset and the ready to learnness that we're all about. I love that and mindset so pertinent, isn't it? And important to us all, never mind at, at that young age. But what I love about the, the stuff that you talk about, Jen, and that was one of the reasons I wanted to have a conversation with you is kids, young people, children are fundamentally important to our country, Scotland, but to the world, because we hope that they'll not just flourish for, for themselves, for Scotland, but actually they'll have a contribution to, to, to the world at large. Um, and and I, if I think, I mean, I'm, I'm 39 this year, Man, I'm 14, 2022. And the, a lot of the stuff you spoke about there, uh, so um, passionately and eloquently, they weren't things that I was taught at school. Nor me. Well, we weren't taught about mindset. I was probably in my late 20s before I really understood what mindset was and being reflective and self-aware and resilience and all these things. Mental health. Did we ever have a conversation at school about mental health? Mm -hmm can't remember um so i think what i love about your social uh, social mission social movement is that it feels it's the right time for, for these conversations in school so applaud i applaud you and your directors for that where, where do you think though scotland is right now where young young kids in scotland are right now jenna though i mean it has been a difficult year for 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 everyone and notwithstanding these young these young people where, where do you feel the mood is with young people in scotland right now though just in your personal observations yeah and it, it certainly is only my personal perspective and i'm very aware that part of the mission of the gifted kind is to give voice to youth and the community to families to educators to find out what's really going on um, but I think it is quite a mixed bag and it's very individualised. For some families, they've thrived in this time. They've benefited so much from, you know, especially parents who work full time, having, if they've been furloughed or they've been unable to work, um, that, that's made such an impact into the connection that they have. And, but then for some people, they'll, they'll have had financial struggles and extra worries that, that you know that carries itself on the shoulders of children and but equally I think because the last year has changed so much and it's continually evolving and fingers crossed we're all we're coming out the other end of it um it's just so important to know that that that, that emotion that that feeling that nudes like you know what what's really happening out there is changing all the time and actually one of the things we are doing over the next 12 weeks in four weeks separate chunks is to do now 
somebody can correct me if I'm wrong at the, at the end of this when you when you post this recording but we are championing that we are the first people to have ever done a, a happiness survey for Scotland so the first four weeks we're looking to hear from parents and families the second four weeks we're looking to hear from educators and those working in the community with children and young people and in the last four weeks heading into the summer holidays we're looking to hear from children and young people so three separate ways to reach out to really suss out um yeah where we are now yeah how, how happy are we yes. right now or, how, or actually how unhappy are we aha uh-huh. and what our understanding of happiness is yeah yeah there's no doubt about it um maybe there's been quite a lot learned in this last year. Indeed, indeed. I think, am I right in saying, uh, is Finland not one of the happiest countries in the world? I think Finland rings a bell. Uh, yeah, well, the Happiness Survey Index comes out every year and it's always been countries like that that I think have really inspired me, you know, like Dubai, the UAE, when I was travelling there for my mum's retirement holiday. I remember listening to a podcast in the plane and they were one of the first countries in the world to appoint a happiness minister. Um, obviously all of the amazing work that the Scandinavian countries do with play-based learning, um, no standardised testing till the age of eight. And I think Scotland, there is a movement within Scotland around yeah. that. Yeah. Because, um, you know, champion that the early years in Scotland is actually up to the age of eight mm-hmm. and not the beginning of primary one. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, there's so much inspiration to be had from other countries or you know, even places like India who have a full syllabus for teaching happiness. That's a core part of the curriculum. So it's like, why, why, why can't we do that too? Yeah, why are we not doing something? Yeah, but it doesn't have to always be the first to market. We can be, look, be looking at our, uh, our brothers and sisters internationally and taking some best taking some best practice. I'm fascinated, Jen, to find out a bit more about the the, the, the change in lifestyle from you. Maybe not a change in lifestyle, correct me if I'm wrong, but that change of career path from obviously having a nurturing teaching uh, intrinsic style within you that you went to university, you became a, you became a teacher. When did you have the epiphany at school that you realised that Teaching was obviously for you in one shape or form, but it it wasn't it, it wasn't the, the the primary teaching. Tell us a bit about that. I mean, I remember when I made the decision to resign from teaching, and I consulted like the ten close people in my life, from family members, friends, colleagues, eh, mentors, and none of them were surprised, um, especially close family members, because I was always quite versatile at school Uh Um, I was um, quite studious as well so when it came to you know fifth and sixth year and applying to university which was my dream to be able to do that I had quite a lot of options but it always came back to primary teaching my grandma was a primary teacher and she was a big part of my upbringing Um, so obviously probably influenced by that and equally I had my own Miss Honey experience um, <laughs> the only teachers I honestly can hand in my heart say this that actually asked me how I was every day on the carpet made me feel like she really cared about how I felt inside and I wanted to be that person for a child too so can we, can we, can we, do we know her name who was that? That's it was actually a stand-in teacher. She was there for three what? months while my actual teacher was going having an, a, some sort of surgery, I think. Because I remember it had she had a profound. She obviously had a profound impact on you, though. That yeah, and you know that's actually an amazing part about what we do now. Because yes, we don't get to be part of children's full journey, and neither does any professional. I always try. I always try to encourage that in the parents that I worked with. You know, you're the consistent part of your child's upbringing. Really good point. You need to make sure that you're the communication channel as each year progresses. Um, so yeah, I I think I was, as you said, just always naturally inclined. That kind of nurturing part of my personality with children, understanding like how we learn, how to learn. But again, as much as people weren't surprised, I remember one of my colleagues at the time saying, "Well, you always said you wouldn't be in teaching forever," and I was like, "Did I?" yeah you said you were going to go and do something entrepreneurial just like your dad had done because that's the thing it's this whole nature versus nurture thing the whole are entrepreneurs born or bred um you know are you a natural leader are you made a leader and I think my, my dad my dad passed away when I was 19 and there was probably just this part of me that what are you really going to do with this one precious life of yours so when push came to shove my, my, my aunt had founded her own charity which is a leading charity within Ayrshire and um, she's happily retired from now and helps advise me at times. Okay. Um, 
she gave me my first mindfulness book. And like yourself, that's the first time I'd ever came across, you know, what even is this? And luckily through my mum's profession, she was a manager within the NHS. I had access to do this mindfulness course, a practitioner certification course. And then I took to, my, took to doing a 12 week research project with my primary six class at the time. And I wrote myself a letter and six months later received it. And it was, you know, all right, okay, cool. Everything's tickety-boo, everything's ticking along. And the last sentence was, if you still find yourself to be unfulfilled within your career, be brave enough to do something about it. Love that. What? How did my six months ago self know that I wasn't fulfilled? I'd got to the point where I'd been four years at the same school. You know, are you going to go into principal teaching? Are you going to um, go into a promoted post? Uh, or is there something else out there for you? Again, just had always had this thing about having a resource company. I would spend my whole summers in the school making resources for my class for the whole year. And, and you know, there, it wasn't just goodwill. I genuinely wanted to do it. <laughs> so, was, that, was that something you enjoyed, Jenna? Was that a part of the job you really enjoyed? Was the kind of exploration, the, the, the kind of doing that primary research, if you like, to find out what was out there to make your teaching, your teaching in school better? Did you enjoy that part? Yeah, I think we were like at Strathclyde University, we were very much brought into this curriculum for excellence, looking at, you know, meeting the individual needs of the child. And um, I mean, the workload went skyrocket because of that. Oh. And I quite quickly had to learn from colleagues with wisdom and experience, like this is actually what you need to be able to stay, sustain that as a primary teacher. Um, but I think I got quite specialised within dyslexia friendly initiatives. I was fascinated with how dyslexics think. I mean, I never had any favourites in my classes. I loved every children individually and equally, just like I do all my nieces. I'm sure you did. <laughs> but I was just, I just found dyslexic learners remarkable. The, and, and a lot of the mindset work that I probably started to use and see change within children was to benefit those children who were just as capable, just as exceptional, but just needed to learn in a different way. They needed yeah, to be yeah. taught the way they learned. Yeah, yeah. And, and yeah, there's just something about really getting to know children for exactly who they are and helping them shine a bit brighter. And, and when you decided to leave teaching then, when you had that moment of and that letter came through to... to remind you six months later again very powerful when did you realize that right I, I'm out I, I'm out I'm going um but <laughs> was it a did you did you know you were leaving to do the gifted kind or was that a, a, another piece of kind of um discovery of various hypotheses to you decided what you were going to do um, yeah I think there was quite a lot of um catalysts agents of change um but on the most part, there was just this feeling that if I could take myself out of under one roof and come out from come in from the outside, I could make a bigger impact. Yeah. There was definitely a feeling of wanting the buck to stop with me, which mm -hmm. is and that something you need to have as an entrepreneur. So thank goodness that was one of the reasons I claimed this trailblazing kind of part of what I do, because once you step out, there is nobody giving you permission or telling you what to do or um and it's over for you make it happen <laughs> uh-huh um so but no I didn't know the gifted kind was going to be the thing I didn't even know what social entrepreneurship was definitely knew I had an entrepreneurial spirit but it was it was very much right you've got one month to work as a notice and in that month you're going to journal every night and research what's next and it was very much like what do you want in five years writing sentences writing words about what you wanted to be and do and have and that led me into doing a, a diploma in personal performance and life coaching which I went down to London for and I think I think I probably did know about that before it's yeah. something that's hard to remember but I remember needing flexibility to be able to travel to London on a Friday and come back on a Monday so my whole game plan was right if I can get a part-time teaching job do further qualifications to sort of change career path or become more specialist in something, then in a couple of years time, it will all pay off and I'll kind of keep myself afloat. I'll have the best of both worlds. And actually I did end up specializing in dyslexia, work with Dyslexia Scotland with that part-time career work. And then a, a part-time job came up at a primary school where they'd found out all the things I was doing and offered me to oversee health and wellbeing from nursery to primary seven. Um, the head teacher at the time who'd kind of championed that actually retired six months into me starting and it was very much do you know what you do you know I actually had a, 
uh, what you call those sessions. Anyway, it was with one of the coaches that came into the hub at the yeah. door. So I'd been part of Entrepreneurial Spark as well. And then like the last cohort and then moved into West Coast Accelerator. And one of the coaches that came in, it was like a giant snow globe moment, really shook me up. And I was like, well, let's be honest, Jenna, this isn't really going to take off unless you're fully commit- committed, is it? Oh, shit. Oh, one of those moments. I was like, oh, rumbled. <laughs> I think I cried because that's definitely how I expressed myself. But that's like you know, that's just natural for me. But he was so right, and within a month I resigned again. And but, but, I, but I love but what I love about your story, and it's a story that I hear often. It actually resonates quite uh, strongly with my own story, where I had that time where I had I did have not always, but I did have some champions in, in my previous career that mm. could see that I wanted to do more. And they facilitated that by allowing me to go part-time, by encouraging me to do different things. And I think we've always got to be mindful of these individuals in our life that that mm-hmm. you know, shake that wee bit of fairy dust on us to support our, to support our journey. Not everyone's like that, let's be, no. let's be clear. <laughs> it sounds like you had a few people as well that could see you were on a bigger path here. There was something, there was something uh, else for you. I think there's like a golden thread that obviously runs right through from my childhood that's got me to here. But that part you just spoke about, as much as I've had to make sure I've created boundaries and protected myself with people who just don't get it. <laughs> but the people that do from my business, the Gateway Advisor, the people that um, came in and gave their time for free in the hub, um, to some of the head teachers that I worked with who you know, passed me little plaques and, and, you know, told me to go and dream big and that you had the courage to step out, like go, go and achieve that things. Or, you know, there was two teachers in my time at the primary school where I worked in full time as my last position. Uh-huh. And, um, you know, one was, she just wished she could be in her classroom every day in the upper school. And one, you wish she could be in her classroom every day in the lower school. And they completely got it, you know, and I still meet them for, well, not for the last year, but meet them for a scone and a coffee. And even though they spent their full career, they just understood my mission and they you're see, right, just see, think of magic on me. Yeah, they could see they could see where you were going. And, and, and I love what you mentioned earlier about that I, I could go out. Yep, I'm, I'm adding I'm adding some you didn't know it was the gifted kind then, but you were adding some gifts to the kids that you had in your class, but you could see that actually that's great, but I could have that impact wider. Yeah. Uh, and, and I think that's a moment. Do you know what was lovely at the time? instantly the children that I had in that class I mean I remember one child writing me this huge big letter and it was to the teacher who followed her dreams <laughs> there was one there was one child who was absolutely heartbroken I still have the plan and I want it every single day that he gave me in my last days and I promised him I'd look after it and make sure that there was going to be a reason why I left and even a parent in that class who is a part of a community organization that I've been in touch with recently you know, she even said to me, Jane, I used to wonder why you had my children doing mindfulness and they weren't practicing their times tables or they were out in the grass, lying down, listening to the birds or you know, whatever they perceived it to be, really skeptical, um, but knew it was a research project so they couldn't really stand in my way. And she said, you know, my daughter's now in fourth year at school and she talks about you nearly enough every week, if not every other week, about the impact you've had. And I thought, wow. But the power... The power- <laughs> I'm so glad I've stuck with this because there were there are and there were so many people who were skeptical and I thought you know what I really believe in this and even though for you you want instant gratification or instant change and um, instant rewards or a score to put down on a sheet of paper I know this is about the long term this is about the future of our children and yeah I just yeah believe. You're, you're, you're the champion of it and what you're like everyone I'll speak to people about Jenna not everyone's a fan not everyone's a fan of everything. Do you know, some people like tomato sauce, some people don't. Some people, we, we, Matt, I'll always say to entrepreneurs that I work with, uh, and, and I have to remind myself this often, often um, internally, is that not everyone's a fan. Your job as an entrepreneur is to find people who are fans. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and that's and that's what it is. There's always going to be people in the sidelines that throw their tuppence worth in and um, have their critique. It's not always welcomed, uh, and we just need to take that on board. But, but continue yeah. striving forward to find the fans and the super fans. Talk- I've, heard, I've heard you speak about that whole early adopter thing. Is that is that not um, Jeffrey? Mo- what is it? The crossing the chasm book about you just need to find that that small percentage of people. So I, I wish I'd read that at the start. By the way, that's. Yeah, I can't say I can't say I can't claim to have read that book, but I think it was something someone said to me a long time ago around not everyone's a fan. Get over that and just find more fans. And if you don't find fans, you've got a wee bit of a problem. 
<laughs> so you maybe need to look at your value proposition. So all that stuff comes round in circles. Tell us quickly, Jenna, about the social entrepreneur side, because yet yeah, the, as we know, entrepreneurship's grown into multifaceted areas. Mm. There's so many types of entrepreneurship now. But but talk to us about uh, briefly the, the the social entrepreneurship journey that you're on right now. Yeah, so I mean, I'm technically classed as a not for profit organization, but in my mind, I'm a for profit organization. It's just that what we do with our profits goes back to the community or gets reinvested in our um, organization. But I don't think it's in the last year, I don't think it's since the last year that I've fully awakened the potential of social entrepreneurship within Scotland. Uh-huh. And it's almost like something happened, and it's definitely through my uh, first port organization who facilitate the social entrepreneur fund who have just opened me up to this breadth and wealth of other organizations Um, i was actually asked to do a case study for the scottish government um about you know how covid's affected women in entrepreneurship and i don't really like to be seen as different in entrepreneurship but equally i understand having done an accelerate her program that until we are um you know, up there at the same level, this has to happen. We need to fill the gap somehow. Yeah. So I get on board with these things and I was like, I'm determined to make this a positive case study. So like bear with me. Um, but from things like uh, Social Enterprise Academy, the School of Social Entrepreneurs, Social Enterprise Scotland, Social Investment Scotland, there's just so many organisations out there to support um, third and fourth sector in Scotland. And social entre- social entrepreneurship for me is... Definitely if we have lived experience and a skill set come together to create, you know, whether it's short, medium or long term change. Um, and I think there's something about there's the thought leadership that exists within that, being willing to be a pioneer of something. Um, and equally, uh, yeah, being willing to kind of break the mold, if that makes sense. And raise, that, your head, um, raise your head above the parapet as such, maybe even. Yeah, and I've not always been very comfortable with doing that, but that's something I've really had to work on. You know, I think in this last year, I've moved from being the founder Mm -hmm. into the leader. Mm -hmm. And um, if anything, you know, I've really invested in my leadership skills in the last year from different programs I went on. And this year is definitely about digital skill set. But I have to get more comfortable with using my voice and being willing for that voice, even when it does sound different, to still have a voice. Yeah, and to be heard. Yes, to be heard. I think that when I... I think the thing about social entrepreneurship for me and what I'm learning by it, I'm certainly by no matter means an expert in it, uh, and uh, you would give me any education on it, Jenna, <laughs> but what, uh, what inspires me about social entrepreneurship, entrepreneurs inspire me, of course, but the, the word social in front of that is for me the common good. It, it, it's actually about the common good. It's about just doing good, not just, because just can undermine things, doing good stuff for people in society. Um, and, and whether that be older generation just happens to be young uh, young children, young people, uh, but there's so many good social causes out there, good people doing good stuff in their community. And that's what Forever Getting Conversations is all about, having conversations with people who are, are doing good stuff. They're not all, all social entrepreneurs, but by heck, let's shine a light on people who are doing great stuff in their community, not just local community, Scotland as a community and, and, and I think that the movement that you're on uh, should absolutely be championed and but your energy or your genergy uh, <laughs> and obviously with, with um, your other directors Louisa and Karen who hopefully we'll get to hear more about as the, as the months and years go on uh, you, you should have a, a big following of people supporting you especially yeah. when, it's the, when it's for the young people before we, we jump on to the final three you know we're, we're nearly done it just flies past. I want to hear quickly though about your plans for the future. So uh, I get through your conversation. Obviously, the organisation had to pivot last year slightly. We're going on. We're doing some more digital offerings potentially because you couldn't physically get into your environments. But now we're hopefully starting to see a, a, a slight change. Um, hopefully, going forward. What what is the plan for the organisation in, in, in the year or two years ahead, Jenna? Okay, so. We have just partnered with our own digital partner, say, um, for tens of thousands of pounds worth of digital innovation plans. Um, interestingly enough, uh, a week before lockdown, speaking of those early adopters, those people that get it, I had sort of five nursery leaders, so earlier centres managers, essentially, who were right on board and were like, you say the word, we, are, we want to do this. 
um, but I knew I needed time. So a lot of the work that we were doing previously was from mm. early years right into workplaces and individuals as well in the first year, because I'd only been trading for 11 months before um, COVID happened and we were just starting to take off. Like we'd been picked up for innovative practice um, within different local authorities. Uh, our first school in Glasgow City Council finished our whole Creating Mindful Children programme. Yeah, things were just really starting to happen. And then, um, but in, interestingly, the week before lockdown, we sat out, we sat down in a coffee shop, me and this other leader of one of the local nurseries that I was, you know, just trying to iterate with and yeah. figure things out with and mapped out a full digital and like takeover plan basically of how this could work at scale. And then lockdown happened. So that, it's almost like, you don't know whether you've been fast-tracked, accelerated. You don't really know what's happened in the last year, but whatever happened, I'm exactly where I'm meant to be from a year ago, <laughs> even though it was really messy and challenging and troublesome, and you weren't quite sure you were going to make it through at times. Um, so our plans now are to partner with our first ever early year centre as our pioneering partners. That's what we're calling them. We have applications from over six local authorities and like an eight week search that we did. And we're actually down to our short list now and the interviews go ahead at the end of this month. Drum roll coming soon then, drum roll. Yeah. And um, honestly, some of the applications made me cry. I just can't believe, we've, well, of course I can believe it because it's Scotland and I know this, there's people out there that are already doing incredible things. And it's just, a, it's just about creating, yes, a training side to the business and a way that we can impact on children and families because, you know, some of my favourite sessions to do are when there's a child in the room, a parent and a practitioner. It's like a wee triad thing going on and we're just facilitating it. Um, so it's like, how do we bring all this to life digitally? How do we have a hybrid model so we can still be in person? Because to be honest, that's when G energy is in full force. Just putting yeah. in a child and I'm as happy as Larry and I don't even need to think what I'm doing next. Um, but equally, we are creating an, an innovative award for early years, really shining a light in the early years, really making sure there's investment in the early years, not just for practitioners, but for parents. Um, and this, this pioneering partner will be the first early year centre in Scotland to ever be given this award. Well, whoopee, I can't wait to see or hear who this school, our lucky school, are, are going to be. And yeah. please continue to champion this whole being happy begins early message, because I just think whoever come up with this, that for you, if it was yourself, um, I, I love it. Being happy begins early, I just think, is so powerful. So we've got to that stage where um, we ask three questions to every guest that comes on uh, for every great conversation and the first question I'm going to ask you Jenna is where's your favourite place to visit in Scotland when we can and where are you desperate to get to in Scotland when we're able to get out of these local restrictions? Yeah so for like the first 30 years of my life I hadn't really gone any further than Fort William yet we holidayed every single year in Scotland barely like barely got to go abroad when we were younger uh -huh. um, but we've always gone to this really special place called Loch Allen Loch Allen and it's on the sound of Mull it's got a sea loch um, gorgeous views over to Mull and it has a ferry terminal and things um, and we've always gone as a big family I think sometimes there's been nearly you know around 20 of us yeah. uh, family have actually just bought a holiday home there so we were lucky enough wow. to go the last lockdown lifted but we never got to go as a family but last year my partner and I did North Coast 500 so I can actually say I've been to the top of Scotland now which was amazing but no Loch Allen is the most special place ever to me in the whole world. Loch Allen we need to check it out then need to check it out. <laughs> Inspiration. There'll be a lot of people that have inspired you over your life, I'd imagine, and there'll be a lot of people that will continue to inspire you. But who's the person, uh, if you think in your heart now, that, that's inspired you the most or, or inspires you right now, Jenna? <laughs> I'm laughing because I could honestly cry at this person. I mean, I've, I've listened to every episode of your um, podcast so far, and I'm like, most of your guests are people that were already inspiring me and absolutely inspiring me now. So I definitely say all of them. And I don't want to say somebody, someone, say someone that somebody else has. Yeah. So, but the person that's really come into my heart is my cousin Nicola. She's been like a big sister to me. And she really, she knows she's gone and done a sabbatical on her own in South America. Um, she's got four children and a full-time job she does over full days. Like, you know, she works for the Scotland's last independent law firm and um one of the largest stories, what I mean, and uh -huh, I just, 
her ambition just keeps on rising and I don't know how she does it and that that for me is exactly who I'd I'd love to be in this next decade of my life. <laughs> well, to your cousin Nicola. <laughs> Nicola, that is for you. Nicola, please share the conversation on the podcast. <laughs> and all her corporate channels. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, in every in every internal channel, get it out there. <laughs> uh, but well done, Nicola. Great stuff. And finally, uh, the quote, the quote that, that you go to for a bit of perspective or that, that means something to you every now and again. Yeah. The one that I can just say right away without having to read it again. I mean, I love quotes. I would cover my whole house in them just to inspire me every day. Um, but I think my favourite one is, if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go further, go together. I love it. <laughs> um, and that really resonates me just within my own partnership with my relationship and um, with my significant other, but also with the gifty kind. And you know, that is where we're at now. We're really looking to get other non-directors and other people on board um, to support the strategic vision of what where we're going. Um, and I, I know that I can't do this on my own. Go further. I, I, the last bit, I love the last bit, to go further, go together. It's really um it's really powerful. Well, listen, Jenna, thank you so much for giving us your time today for, for having a great conversation. I, I would just like to say I, I wish you, and just to make sure you get your, your director's names correct, Louisa and Karen, every success with the, the whole social movement of the gifted kind. As a parent of two kids, um, as a, a, an entrepreneur, sometimes the word entrepreneur it doesn't fit even well with me, it's something I struggle with. Uh, but I think for what you've achieved and what you're going to achieve with this movement and especially helping the, the the future of our country for when me and you are no longer on this planet that there's a, a a lovely group of young leaders coming through that have got a wee bit of that gifted kind magic um spreading oh, through their brains uh, that's that, that's that. That's really powerful. And if that's what's championing you, uh, I wish you every success going forward. Uh, and thank you for being part of the conversation. Oh, thank you, Frank. And thank you for believing. In, and I definitely am going to be sprinkling mindful magic everywhere I go. It's for Scotland. <laughs> well, it's for Scotland. On that note, folks, thank you so much for all your support with Forever Great and Conversation. Please share the podcast, share the YouTube uh, video and get it out there to more people across Scotland. Until next time, stay safe, look after yourself and visit The Gifted Kind online. We'll obviously share all the links to social media on uh, the narrative within the, the post as well. So until next time, look after yourself. All the best. Thank you.